When I first created the Oxcentric YouTube channel, I knew I wanted it to be about Oxford. It's where I study, it's where I live for half the year, and it's where I feel most like me. That said, my story didn't start in Oxford. That's why I've come here to a slightly windswept hill on the outskirts of Greater Manchester to talk a bit about the north of England, class politics, and what on earth this has to do with the oldest university in the English-speaking world. My name is Sam, and this is Oxcentric. For all my life, I've lived in Greater Manchester. That is until 2022, when for the first time I am moving house outside of the city lines, and it got me thinking a lot about place and how that shapes my identity. Manchester is a city whose roots run deep. It was founded by the Romans, it was the home of the Industrial Revolution, and nowadays still remains highly influential as arguably England's second city after London. What being Mancunian means varies a lot from person to person. That said, we can pretty much all agree that it includes complaining about the near constant rain, knowing all the lyrics to Oasis, don't look back in anger, and perhaps most importantly, never shutting up about the fact you're from Manchester. But beyond Manchester alone, the north of England has its own strong, if broader, identity. The North-South Divide is one of the most pervasive parts of British culture, with the historically more affluent South stereotypically viewing the North as somewhat uncivilised and full of people with silly accents, whereas the traditionally working-class North views the South as overly soft and also full of people with silly accents. If you want to start regional warfare in England, just ask how this word is pronounced. You will never hear the end of it. So that's the scene, but what's this got to do with Oxford? Oxford is located solidly in the southeast of England. It's an affluent area, with its economy nowadays mostly centred on the presence of its two universities and the tourism that the city attracts. Despite being in the southeast, Oxford University has long had strong links with other parts of the UK. Jesus College has historically had very close ties to Wales, which it continues to celebrate today, particularly on St David's Day, when they run a chapel service in Welsh. Trinity College was founded using elements from the now defunct Durham College, so it still has that northeastern part to its heritage. In addition to this, these historic links have often been revived as colleges begin to target specific link regions with their admissions and outreach work. In 2020, London and the South East accounted for approximately 47% of Oxford's UK student intake. However, in the 2011 census, these two areas only accounted for around 27% of the UK's total population. So as a proud northerner in Oxford, I can't help but wonder, why is there this disparity? Contrary to what you might expect, this proportion of southerly admissions has actually increased recently. Comparing the oldest complete set of data from 2007 with the most recent from 2020, we can see the proportion of students coming from London has increased sharply, whereas the proportion coming from the rest of the southeast has declined a little. Some facts in this gap are easy to explain. For example, if a Scottish student performs well academically and wants to go to university, they are much more likely to choose St Andrews or Edinburgh where they can study without having to pay any tuition fees, as opposed to travelling south to Oxford where they would have to pay. In addition to this, geography does play a major role. Students often want to move away from home for university, but not too far away from home, which may mean that students from particularly geographically far-flung areas like the North East may be further disincentivised from applying. However, I don't think these fixed external factors are the real reasons we see this disparity. And to uncover those, we need to talk about class. Both Oxford and Cambridge traditionally were a preserve of only the rich, powerful and privileged. Christchurch College in Oxford alone has educated at least 13 British Prime Ministers. King's College in Cambridge previously only used to accept students from Eton College, a single elite British fee-paying school, until 1850. And that's not to mention the fact that most colleges at both universities did not admit women until the late 1970s at the earliest. With that said, the demography of both universities has changed drastically during the 21st century. The percentage of state school students has been consistently trending upwards for the last five years at Oxford, in addition to rises in both the number of students coming from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and students who identify as ethnic minorities. This is not to say that the work is over, it's absolutely not, but I do think the progress that has been made does deserve to be applauded. 
I think the current regional divides we see in Oxford's admissions today crystallise a wider issue of class. You remember that I mentioned the North-South divide earlier? Well, for some people it's just something that you joke about at the dinner table, but the truth is that it does have real human consequences. For example, due to systemic underfunding of government services in the north of England, residents of London have life expectancies nearly three years longer than their counterparts in the northeast. This funding divide extends to education. In the 1990s, London state schools were seen as in crisis. However, during the 2000s, a sustained programme of improvements called the London Challenge was able to completely reverse this perception. Nowadays, London's rates of progression to higher education are much better than the northern regions, and it also has the smallest attainment gaps for free school meal students in the whole UK. This means that despite pockets of significant socio-economic deprivation in the capital, London's comparatively well-funded education system is able to achieve some of the best outcomes for all of its students, regardless of their background. You might be thinking, well if it works so well in London, why didn't they try it elsewhere? But the truth is that they did try. The Black Country, so that's mostly focused around the city of Wolverhampton, and Manchester both had their own city challenge schemes, which took inspiration from the London Challenge. However, these were cut short after running for only about three years, when a new coalition government took power, generally speaking, seeking to cut public spending. Obviously, there's no guarantee of this, but I can't help but feel that given a bit more time and resources, these programs could have been truly transformational to educational outcomes in these areas in a way that we didn't really see happen in our reality. You may well be thinking, so what if Northern students don't go to Oxford? After all, there are plenty of other good universities in the UK. And yes, that may be true, but I think it ignores the unique opportunities that attending a university like Oxford can provide. An Oxford degree has long been seen as a ticket to wealth and success. This goes hand in hand with the strength of the Oxford brand, which is built upon centuries of heritage and its reputation for academic rigour in the present. However, I think that the unique strengths of Oxford go much beyond branding. The networks and friendships built at Oxford have helped its alumni to gain positions of huge power and influence. For example, for the last decade or so, the UK government has been led by a small clique of Oxonian politicians who mostly got their start in the debating halls of the Oxford Union back in the 1980s. So that includes the likes of David Cameron, Theresa May and Boris Johnson. Furthermore, Oxford and Cambridge are wealthy institutions who can support disadvantaged students financially in a way that many other universities simply can't. At Oxford, this is primarily done through an array of scholarships and bursaries. However, some of the richer colleges will also subsidise day-to-day amenities like food and rent, which does result in more affordable living costs. In my opinion, when students in the North are underrepresented in Oxford, they lose out on unique opportunities for social mobility, which further reinforces the existing regional inequalities that we see in the UK today. I would also argue that having a smaller number of alumni from these regions means that there are less people to provide guidance in admissions and demystify the Oxford experience, which means that these inequalities can very easily self-perpetuate if left unchecked. In summary, as is often the case, what goes on in Oxford is simply a reflection of the wider state of British society. In this case, the admissions data shows the widening gap between the North and the South, in particular the areas surrounding London. Oxford's goal is to recruit the students with the most academic potential. However, disentangling that potential to learn from students' previous experience and life circumstances is often much easier said than done. Far too often, the circumstances students stop them from even considering the likes of Oxford, whether it be due to problems at home or a lack of good schools nearby. This is something I saw firsthand during my own educational experience, where the most vulnerable students were least likely to receive the support that they needed to reach their academic potential. Now, I don't purport to have a complete plan to solve UK regional inequality. If anyone does, it's probably not a 19 year old with a YouTube channel and an overinflated sense of self-importance. However, for the issues of education that we've discussed today, I think a very viable start would be to consider recommencing the City Challenge scheme in key northern areas like Manchester, Liverpool and Newcastle. 
These are cities with their own devolved political administrations and would likely have the clout to force concessions from an otherwise apathetic central government. Regional inequality is a systemic problem which requires systemic solutions, not just cheap talk about levelling up. Admissions for a region, however, will always be dependent on the number of applications. So if you're a student from the north, then maybe consider this your sign to do a bit of research and see if Oxford might be right for you. Every point in these admissions data is someone with their own story. Maybe yours involves Oxford. We're done now. Oh my God, it's so, so cold. I can't wait to go back inside. <laughs> Oh my god, put my clothes back on.